Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Police Practices Group's learning series. Um, and tonight we are going to be working on uh, the ADR subgroups um, work. And I wanted to start by allowing uh, County Manager Mark Schwartz to introduce the Police Practices Group and its charge. Mark? Thank you very much, Devanchi. Appreciate that. Um, as uh, Devanchi said, tonight's session is Everyone, focusing on all training and dispute resolution. Learning series. Uh, Vanessa, I'm going to ask you, you're going to have to mute now, otherwise, there's going to be feedback. I'm okay. sorry. No, that's all right. Um, so, the Police Practices Group uh, was announced back in July, and the, the purpose of the group. Uh, is twofold. We have employed some fantastic uh, you know, uh, experts in the field of police practices. Marcia Thompson is with us today, uh, assisted by Julie Shedd from the Carter School, and they're doing an assessment, external assessment of all the uh, Arlington County Police Department's practices in a number of areas, including use of force, uh, training, supervision, recruitment, retention, data statistics, and the like. And then the police practices group is going to be the beneficiary of seeing that information and analyzing it. In the meantime, there are four subgroups that we've asked to look at some very specific issues, including a civilian review board, uh, the role that police play in mental health services. A third group is taking a look at traffic enforcement. And the group that is here tonight is looking at the opportunity for alternative dispute resolution including restorative justice and mediation options. So we're very excited. We look forward to a uh, interesting conversation. And with that, I think I'm going to turn it back to you, Devanchi. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Um, so uh, Marcus, was, when we're looking at the alternative dispute resolution subgroup, it has um, two main um, goals that it is reviewing. Um, uh, option alternatives, excuse me, alternatives to traditional policing and alternatives to um, traditional criminal justice options. Um, and I wanted, to, before we jump into the presentation, I wanted to take a moment to just recognize the members of the Alternative Dispute Resolution subgroup. Um, my name is Devanshi Patel. I'm the chair of the subgroup. Um, we also have, as, as part of the membership, is Elizabeth Valderrama. She is um, with OAR. Um, Latasha Chamberlain, who is with the Arlington County Police, uh, Parissa Dagani Tafti, who is our Commonwealth Attorney, and Acting Chief um, Andy Penn. Um, so with that, I, we have a really exciting presentation this evening with two wonderful um, speakers tonight who will be discussing um, options for uh, alternatives to traditional policing as well as um, options to uh, traditional criminal justice um, involvement. And so the first speaker uh, is Vanessa Perry Darif, and she is the director of training at the Metropolitan Police Academy in Chicago, Illinois. Um, the MPA, the Metropolitan Police Academy, is within the community-based framework of Communities Partnering for Peace, uh, CP4P, um, and it, which was convened by the Metropolitan Family Services Agency. It provides a comprehensive long-term uh, work, which is rooted in nonviolence, trauma-informed care, hyper-local collaboration, and restorative justice practices to reduce violence in Chicago. Vanessa will be speaking with us about how MPA is training police to serve as peacekeepers and how they are redefining um, pol uh, community policing, that concept. We're also joined by Mary Williams, who is the program manager for the city of Charlotte um, Community Relations Department and its dispute settlement program. The dispute settlement program has been providing mediation and conciliation services to the Charlotte Mecklenburg residents since um, 1983. Mary will share with us her, how her agency uses mediation in lieu of traditional criminal justice alternatives. So really exciting work is happening in both Chicago and in Charlotte. And with that, um, I will turn it over to Vanessa, and then we'll be followed. Who will be followed immediately by Mary, and then we'll open it up for question and answer. Thank you. Thank you so much, Devonte. Uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, having me here this evening. It is indeed a pleasure to talk about the work that we're doing here in Chicago. I'm sure that 
uh, what you hear about our city um, across the headlines really draw some concern. And I hope today we shed some light and as we're trying to create a counter narrative here in our city um, as it relates to how I respond and our approach to um, violence in our city and how we build community and how we work together and, and restoring this um, our approach to community policing. And so today I'd like this evening, I'd like to start by talking about understanding uh, what we call our community training. Academy. So the Metropolitan Peace Academy is a part of a larger initiative. Uh, We're a part of a larger team. It's called the Metropolitan Peace Initiatives, or MPI. We sit under the auspices of the Metropolitan Family Services Organization, which is a social service institution dedicated to serving uh, different communities in Chicago as it relates to domestic violence, providing housing, um, serving uh, young fathers, youth, seniors, and everyone who needs collective services as we seek to restore communities and rejuvenate those within the community. Um, also, MPI, MPI, as the Metropolitan Peace Initiatives team, we support a collective of 15 communities community outreach organizations across the city of Chicago. So they're located across uh, the north, south, east, and west parts of the city because we respond uh, based on the data. We respond to where the data dictates. And so if it says that we need to go south, we will partner with an organization in that particular area in which we provide outreach um, services in the areas of workforce development, uh, case management, behavioral health, as well as violence reduction. These 15 uh, community outreach organizations are called Communities Partnering for Peace, or CP4P. That particular number, that number four stands for the four pillars in which we thread our work through. Those four pillars are hyperlocality, trauma-informed, uh, nonviolence, as and restorative justice. And so the Metropolitan Peace Academy is one of the supports that we provide to those 15 uh, outreach organizations. It is the training arm of the Metropolitan Peace Initiatives team. It is where we train our outreach workers. And since we started in January 2018, we now train case managers, community residents, and law enforcement officers. So since its inception, uh, it's become a training ground for the city of Chicago. We've been called upon uh, most recently. We've just completed a three day training uh, across the city of Chicago where we uh, trained our district coordinating officers. And so and as well as the officers who've recently graduated uh, from the police academy. And so we were uh, delivered this charge as it relates uh, because of the federal consent decree our um, law enforcement agency received. And so in order to support this effort, we were asked to come in and train our district coordinating officers in all of our districts. And so our first initial uh, effort was a, a three day collective that I'll talk more in depth about in a minute. So collectively, our curriculum um, included a team of um, a team of officers, uh, trainers, CPD administration. Um, we created a three day, 24 hour curriculum, uh, and its purpose was designed to help our officers become more informed about the communities that they served. So our, our um, training academy goals, of course, you always want to ground your work and build coherence and making sure that all of your work reaches back and is aligned to these particular goals and objectives. So initially, what we hope, um, walking away, you know, as we build this ultimate, ultimate academy, our ultimate goals, um, which are uh, ongoing, always ongoing, always ever arching, we hope to increase officers' capacity to work collaboratively, uh, effectively, and respectfully with the residents and stakeholders and their district. Uh, we hope to deepen officers' understanding of key historical factors related to policing. All of this hoping to inform a lens. Uh, officers will also learn to directly, um, directly from community members. And so we were not the ones, as the academicians or the curriculum designers, we were not the ones always standing in front of the officers to facilitating the lessons. This particular conversation was delivered from the community members from those particular districts um, and vetted stakeholders about key assets in the community and challenges that they face in their neighborhoods. Um, officers will also develop an understanding of their personal biases that prevent authentic community police engagement. So this particular lift is something that we do across Academy and all of our lanes. Um, we do a lesson with our outreach workers that is entitled addressing the isms to do to ha actually uh, um, attack or um, not attack, but to uh, support this particular objective. So this is not something that is just solely um, 
uh, centered on officers, but it's something that as a, through our trauma-informed approach, we believe that it's always necessary that we um, take a look at our biases. And then finally, to change behavior, we really believe that, you know, there are technical changes, but there are also adaptive changes. And so to change behavior, highlighting the impact trauma has on both sides of the incident. And so understanding that officers respond to various incidents of very, um, variation, we want to make sure that we take part, uh, take care of the officer and those that they are responding to. So some of the concepts uh, used in our curriculum, uh, community building. And when I say these concepts are used, they are threaded throughout. So we will always come back to or have elements of these particular concepts in our curriculum as it's related to community building, uh, trauma-informed approach, uh, using restorative justice dialogue and strategies. Um, I'll talk more about that when I talk about um, how we've structured our days. Uh, multicultural considerations and voice. And when I, we talk about multicultural considerations and voice, it's not always just predominantly on race, but how people learn, how people learn, how we, um, different modalities, uh, how we structure our, our learning environment. Uh, oftentimes we use music. Oftentimes we sit in circle. Oftentimes we have uh, different types of people in leadership positions. So th that when we think about multicultural considerations and voice, we really think about how we can really value everyone in that particular learning community. Um, shared norms and agreements. So as we build community, it's very important that those in the community have an understanding of, you know, in order for us to meet the highest, the optimal um, um, a level in this particular uh, professional learning environment, what are some understandings that we need to have from person to person in order for us to meet that goal? So some of those shared norms and agreements come, they, they come from the community, but some of the examples are um, assume positive intent, uh, start and end on time, but these particular agreements come from the individuals, and as a result, you ask them, um, what do you mean by start and end on time, or what do you mean by leaning to your discomfort? Uh, not only does it garner voice, but it also lets everyone in there know that their voice is valued, that we're not going to move forward with the deep conversations until we create this uh, trusted space, this elevated space of trust and uh, healing, um, and at the same time a safe space for everyone that's involved. Um, in addition to the norms we go through, we make sure that the curriculum is hyper-local, that it's talking about the neighborhoods and the communities in which that individual is serving. So if we're talking about District 9 or for this particular conversation, Arlington County, Virginia, um, what are some concerns? Talking to Devonshi today, um, we talked about some elements of concern in your community. So what are those things that you see peaking in your community that you want to um, uh, garner some support around, you want to speak to, and you want to make sure that whatever curriculum that you design is speaking to those particular elements that you've deemed are most necessary, most critical right now in real time? And then, too, as we uh, study different organizations, as we know, law enforcement is a um, very uh, a huge entity um, in our nation. We also know that organization, uh, with organization development, we must remain flexible. So in our curriculum, we make sure that that flexibility is in there as well. It's a lot of cushion. There's a lot of different um, opportunities and options for facilitators to take different, um, uh, use different strategies. And then if in their skill set, in their wheelhouse, they feel that they need to do something different, they have that option as well. And then lastly, um, an IO psychology lens, which dictates that as the organization changes or as environment changes, so shall the organization. And so that helps to continue to like inform our um, our conversation and inform how we uh, put, the, put the curriculum together and designed it and what concepts we make sure um, continue to be threaded throughout. And so when you design the curriculum, you want to make sure that uh, you tune it. You want to make sure that you tune it and that everyone has voice and they're allowed to uh, give warm and cool feedback on this particular document. Remember that it's a collaborative process. So that particular objective I spoke to as it relates to um, our objectives for the academy, those are threaded through from the, from the time that we start. So it's a collaborative process, making sure that everybody all stakeholders are involved in this tuning process as it relates to the administration, the commanders, the trainers, community, 
youth. And so as a result of our different networks, we were able to siphon this particular curriculum through our different channels to make sure that this was not an aha or a gotcha to our law enforcement, that it was respectfully designed by those who um, wanted to see this very healthy document. And at the same time, um, it still is flexible. It still has that opportunity to even grow even further. So in order to um, get the work done, you have to train the trainers. So who are these people who are training our officers? You have to make sure those individuals have the professional decorum as well as the delivery and the level of engagement to have, to have these important conversations, but at the same time create a um, trauma-informed space a space where people feel that they can have these conversations and talk about those things that sometimes um, polarize us. And so those people are the MPA facilitators. We also use community residents, our ambassadors, and we use subject matter experts as it relates to the neighborhoods who had that uh, hyper-local uh, knowledge, that lived experience. Um, this was a two-day uh, engagement. Uh, we went over the curriculum. We also went over best practices as it relates to facilitation. Um, it was an opportunity for them to apply what we talk about. And then we encouraged trainers to be flexible with the curriculum and not be so married to the agenda. But although structure is, in pop, is, is necessary and there were agendas, we wanted to make sure if there was a conversation that dictated a little bit more time, that there was cushion in the agenda for that. So the um, three-day training, uh, it was three districts across, uh, at the same time across three days. So it was Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, maybe about uh, three weeks ago. Uh, the trainings were located in the communities in which the police would be actually serving. So we trained our districts 9, 10, and 11 first. And so we held our trainings in those particular districts. And our lunches and all of the uh, community residents and the um, the uh, vendors that we used came from those particular um, districts to show our police officers that um, how we use hyperlocality in the work that we do. And then we also train predominantly in circle to really take away the tables and those barriers to kind of really take down those walls and to kind of open everyone up and kind of show um, vulnerability is okay. And so as a result, um, to show that vulnerability is okay, it was expected of our facilitators to be, uh, to position themselves as learners in that space as well. Uh, day one was community building. We build community. Um, one thing that when we put the uh, curriculum together for all of our lanes, community building is the nucleus. It is the undercurrent. It's something that is paramount. It's something that we, we pride ourselves on doing. Um, that community building is uh, check-in, icebreakers, creating those norms. Uh, this is something that we do every day. It's not just when we start our training or start the three-day training, but it's something that we do every day, uh, every meeting, uh, because we want to make sure that we take care of the human before we kind of drill down to the, the, the work that the humans do. Um, we also build community in circle uh, with the law enforcement officers with protocols. We also make sure that we respectfully have protocols to keep things in order um, as we get to know one another. Uh, an example, two truths and one lie or compass points, kind of how we work together in groups. Uh, we talk about self-care. Uh, we do some meditation with our law enforcement officers. They were very, very receptive and appreciative of that. Uh, we got a, a chance to kind of drill down to the intrinsic person uh, with our law enforcement officers. I asked them, uh, who takes care of you? Because at the end of the day, we want our law enforcement officers to show up in a healthy way when they show up to any um, any, any uh, scene, um, when they come to work, when they interface with our community, we always want them to show up in the most healthy way possible. So reflective practices and small group work allowed us to kind of drill down to that intrinsic value that we all bring to different spaces, but sometimes we just don't tap into. And then we had a lot of dialogue with our community gym. So those uh, mental health associations in those uh, districts, housing services, those individuals who can come in and give those uh, human resources as well as those tangible resources. Day two, uh, as a result of day one, um, we asked our officers at the end of day one if they wanted to um, 
come uh, out of uniform or if they have the choice. We know that doing trauma-informed work, it's very good to, uh, one of the elements is choice. And so we asked our officers to make a decision on how they wanted to show up day two. They said we wanted to come out of uniform. And so we did this, that. And so as a result, we built community. We talked about implicit bias. Uh, we used different activities to do that. Uh, we had conversations with street outreach professionals. Uh, and then we also talked about, uh, we did a presentation around Trauma 101. And so when we do that, we put Trauma 101 in the middle of the day, um, in the second day, because it's a very heavy conversation. Implicit bias is, is a heavy conversation. And we wanted to make sure that we had um, built community at least for a day before we kind of had those heavy conversations. Um, officers collectively, like I said before, decided to dress down. Facilitators and officers, they stayed in circle for the entire day. Um, and community building was once again threaded throughout. We used a lot of energizers and icebreakers in between. Uh, day three, uh, um, with any training, I always think that we need more time. That's just who I am as a trainer. But uh, day three was devoted to community tours and the celebration. Uh, community tours, we went through District 9, District 10, District 11, uh, each um, particular uh, training site. Um, everyone loaded on a tour bus and a community ambassador talked to them about the different community influences, um, the significance of each, and then um, the different people and, and the different um, hyper-local lens, like what are the what happens in these respective communities? Who are we and what do we uh, seek to obtain? And, you know, it really helped to um, demystify, it helped to humanize and build relationship, at least a starting point for between our communities and our law enforcement um, um, professionals. And so after the tour, officers received certificates um, and they reflected upon their three-day experience. Uh, just a few of the reflections. I really don't want to break confidentiality because that is a norm across um, um, our trainings. However, uh, based on the evaluations and some of the takeaway, uh, the training uh, should have been longer. It could have been longer. Um, they wanted to have more time to kind of talk about that. Um, but we want to always be respectful of, um, of their time and uh, of their commitment. Uh, this should be a part of our academy training. So in addition to their training, the tactical training that they receive uh, at the academy, they also want some of that um, intrinsic community building training as well that to um, help inform and that trauma-informed lens. Uh, it made me think about things differently, which is when we are trying to create a trauma, uh, not trauma informed, but a counter narrative, we want to have different conversations. And so we were very grateful that uh, we received that feedback that it made me think about things differently. Um, that's one thing that uh, ultimately that we ask. And so uh, one, one lastly, I don't always want to be seen as a monster. So these are, these are, this is how real and transparent um, some of our law enforcement professionals I uh, walked away with. This helped me think about how, that, how this or how this particular um, experience can change that. So as a team, it's always great to debrief. So as a team, uh, some of our reflections, um, we believe the training was impactful. You know, we, we seek to make, uh, to be impactful in this work and uh, not to just be compliance based. It's not just something to say that as a result of the consent decree, we're adhering to it, but it's, it is, we have intentionality in this work um, and that um, it is a value based, a value add to our community. Um, some officers do not want to talk about implicit bias because they talk about it a lot in their academy training. So as a team, we say, how do we keep our dialogue fresh? You know, it's not to say we don't need to talk about implicit bias, but how do we keep our dialogue fresh so that we continue to garner and, and respect um, the voice that um, everyone brings to the community? Uh, due to the lift, we wanted to make sure that we train one district uh, instead of three simultaneously. That was a, we did well, however, in order to make sure all logistics are taken care of and done optimally, I would recommend uh, moving forward, um, we're going to train one district at a time. We want to make sure all participants and facilitators adhere to the norms. Um, the norms are very, very uh, uh, longstanding um, agreements, and even the officers began to hold everyone accountable to making sure that we knew everyone who uh, entered community even if they were visitors. Uh, make sure there is someone who takes care of logistics. And lastly, uh, we will need more time to discuss elephant issues. So make sure you have a norm around um, expect non-closure. You know, non you're going to have some conversations that may start. You may talk about some elephant issues or land there, but you're not, you may not necessarily resolve them, but that's an ongoing conversation. 
um, some of the overall benefits, we started a different conversation in order to implement change. We have to have to, those different conversations. And so this was just that. Um, trying to create the counter narrative where we began to talk about how we care for our officers um, and how they show up. We want them to show up differently. Uh, we, we, um, and so in order for us to do that, we have to have different conversations and begin to talk to them. Uh, how can, and how can we collectively show up differently um, in community? Because it's not always responding to something of a violent nature, but it can just be interchanging and interfacing from day to day. How do we change behavior? Um, I'll drill down to technical changes versus adaptive changes. When I speak of technical changes, I'm talking about policy. When I'm talking about adaptive changes, I'm talking about those that are a little bit more difficult. Uh, I'm talking about those that are a little bit more difficult as it relates to adaptive changes. Uh, and then balancing those technical and technical training with a trauma-informed practice. And then finally, the value add for community relations because it focuses on both of the parties. So I thank you, um, everyone. This is that was the end of the presentation. I wanted to make sure that I could speak to that. The that we make sure that I spoke to um, Devonshi today, and just how we make sure that we highlight the benefits and the um, assets of the human resource as well. So thank you, good people. Thank you, Vanessa. Thanks so much for sharing your program with us. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and and. Uh, have Mary present on the dispute settlement program, and then we'll open it up for questions for both Vanessa and for Mary. Uh, Mary? Okay, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, um, thank you very much for having me here tonight uh, to speak on our dispute settlement program. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, that you're giving me the opportunity and I look forward to sharing some information about our program with you. Um, we are the Charlotte Mecklenburg Community Relations Dispute Settlement Program. Community Relations is basically our umbrella and the Dispute Settlement Program is under that and that encompasses our an alternative to our court processes. And that's what we're going to be talking about this evening. So the Community Relations Department, we're an integral part of the Community Relations Support System for City of Charlotte and Mecklenburg County for over 50 years. And our work is to enhance community harmony, promote our growing uh, cultural diversity. We provide training um, and education and awareness around diversity, equity, inclusion, implicit bias, and conflict resolution. And when I've put our mission and our vision at the bottom, our mission Community relations empowers, collaborates, engages, and promotes our opportunities to create positive outcomes. And our vision is to be recognized as a global model in building community harmony by advocating for diversity, equity, and access for all. Now I'm gonna talk um, in depth about the dispute settlement program. And before I do, it's gonna be the enabling legislation. So our uh, the North Carolina General Assembly has provided a legislation for us to have a community mediation center. Now, this is only a, a small snippet of that. Uh, it's, um, the actual statute is about three pages in length, but I wanted to share this just to show that that the legislation is behind um, behind the creation of community mediation centers, and they find it um, in the public interest to encourage the establishment of community mediation centers also known as dispute settlement centers or dispute resolution centers. And we're trying to support and facilitate communication, understanding and reconciliation and settlement conflicts in communities, courts, and schools, and to promote the widest possible use of these centers by the courts and law enforcement officials across the state. And our center is actually one of 22 uh, across the state of North Carolina that is providing community mediation um, for, our, uh, for our residents. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, the Dispute Settlement Program, we've been around since 1983, and since that time, we've been providing mediation conciliation services for Charlotte Mecklenburg. And we do a variety of cases. We do your landlord-tenant disputes. Most of those are involving rent issues, security deposits, uh, sometimes it's um, discussing the lease and, and ways individuals may be able to get out of their lease. And then there's also the, uh, right now, due to COVID, we're also really working closely with our financial partners in order to help individuals who are facing eviction due to COVID-related um, issues. 
So we're trying to work with the landlords, the tenants, and those financial partners to pay the back rent in order to allow the residents to be able to stay in their homes and the landlords to obviously get their, their monies. Uh, we do neighbor disputes, uh, misdemeanor criminal complaints, and I'll talk a little bit more about those when I talk about private warrant court. Uh, we have 50C no contact orders, as well as a juvenile victim offender program, consumer merchant issues, and school issues and truancy, we try to get the families engaged as well as the, the students to talk about issues that are facing them at school, as well as any reasons why they're not going to school. If there's something impacting them at school, if it's bullying, if it's, if it's you know, they're um, behind on their, their classes, if it's academic, if there's some fa family situations, we can talk with them and see if we can come up with a plan to make sure that the, the students are going to school every day and that we're hoping to uh, reduce any of the in-school or out-of-school suspensions through that program. We do employer-employee relations. Uh, we get those um, cases through our HR department, through our county, and through our city. And we also do self-referrals where individuals can just contact us and let us know that they're having an issue with a roommate, with a civic organization, with a church, and uh, we will hold those those mediations as well. Um, our office is not allowed to do any cases involving domestic violence. Those cases are handled through the court system. Uh, we do not do separation or divorce in our setting, uh, child custody or any felony offenses. Uh, but other than that, we pretty much are open to basically bringing individuals together to discuss their concerns and see if we can come up with a resolution. Next slide, please. Our case referral services, uh, we usually receive approximately between 1,600 and 2,000 referrals a year. We're usually able to do about 1,200 to 1,500 cases a year. And our referrals are coming from a variety of, of um, places. Our district courts, our district attorney's office, our public defenders, and our magistrate's office. Our magistrate's office is very important because we get those cases pre-warned. So individuals can go down to our magistrate's office um, basically anytime. Uh, the magistrate's office is open 24-7 and take out a complaint against someone um, and they will, the magistrate's office will say, I want you to try mediation first and they will give them our card and they will send us the referral and then we will reach out to the clients and try to schedule a mediation. So we're really working really closely with the magistrate's office to get those cases before they even go into court. Our goal is if we can get as many uh, misdemeanor cases outside of court, then for, perhaps that will free up some time for the court to deal with some of the more serious um, cases that they have. Uh, we work closely with local attorneys. Of course, I've talked about landlords and tenants. Homeowners associations are a big one for us, uh, mostly on understanding the bylaws. Um, a lot of times we are called in to do mediations regarding uh, when one board member is leaving and another board member is coming on, sometimes there's some friction there. So we are um, called in to do some mediations regarding those those conversations and and maybe some tensions that are there. Our police department is 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 a very important for us. They'll go out to a call and for the most part, if they deem it to be something that needs to be addressed, however, it doesn't rise to the level of a warrant or a summons, but they know that these individuals need to have something done, then they will actually give them our card and say, we want you to try mediation and see if we can work it things out. Uh, predominantly, our caseload is going to be neighbors, it's going to be coworkers, family members, friends. So it's going to be individuals that have a connection with one another. They have a relationship. And the way our police department, as well as our courts see it, is that by bringing them parties together and see if we can work out a resolution is better than having some kind of adversarial process where there's, you know, one person is, is guilty, one person is innocent, you're right, you're wrong. And mediation is trying to get that win-win. Um, we also uh, obviously work with our school systems and we have a program, it's now called In Living, which is, is actually our local housing authority that we work with um, to, to work on some of our landlord tenant disputes as well. Our juvenile court counselors, which I'll talk about when I talk more about the juvenile victim offender, our human resources and just residents of Charlotte Mecklenburg can call us and see if we can assist them with their complaints. Next slide, please. Um, 
many of you probably know what mediation process is. I just wanted to go over it briefly. It is voluntary where two or more of our parties are using the assistance of a mediator to see if they can work out a resolution that's going to be beneficial to both parties. Um, now, our mediations are totally voluntary. Our courts will encourage individuals to try it, as well as all of our partners will encourage it. However, we cannot uh, mandate that someone attend mediation. Now, there are, me there are mediation programs that do have, have um, mandatory mediations, for instance, you know, for the separation and custody, some of those types of situations. But for our purposes, all of our cases are voluntary in nature. Um, the mediator is there to open the lines of communication. We give everybody an opportunity to talk about the issues, their interests, their needs, and their wants. And most of the time, we find out that a lot of times individuals just have not had the conversation, that they've never really discussed, you know, what do I really want out of this process? What do I really need? What are my interests in this? And that they can have a conversation with someone to see if they can work it out and get that win-win. Uh, we seek to find the commonalities between what each party has discussed, you know, find out, you know, what is positive, what do the parties have that, that is similar in nature. You know, the, the, you have two parents, they both have kids at the same school, that, that's a connection. You know, you're both concerned about, you know, living in a, in a safe neighborhood, that's a connection. So we start with those connections and then we work um, our, ourselves out of that to see if we can work out a resolution that's going to be beneficial uh, to everyone. And then we work with the parties to try to come up with some options that's going to be beneficial for them. And we work them, they work, we work them through that process of brainstorming. And then we help the parties evaluate the options that they've identified. And we write up any agreement that has been reached. And we give the parties a copy, as well as if we need to share the, the copy with any other supporting agency that the individuals may have. Next slide, please. So the benefits of mediation for our disputants is obviously it provides an opportunity to make their own decisions. Um, the disputants have an opportunity to talk openly and have their questions answered. And we are also serving as an avenue for paying restitution. So for example, if we have two individuals and one person um, broke out another's car window and there's a payment arrangement, they can utilize our office as that payment, uh, as that payment source so the parties don't actually have to exchange that money um, together. And so we will, we will basically hold that case open and continue the case um, in the court system and allow for those, um, those payments to be made. And then once they are paid, then we will actually dismiss any court cases that there, that there are. We're an alternative to court conviction. So if, if individuals go through our program and they successfully resolve their case and we can dismiss their case, then they do not have a criminal conviction on their record. Their case is voluntarily dismissed by the court. Now, most um, employers will accept that. There are some that that want, um, in some professions, that want their their um, total record to be swiped clean. If so, a client would actually have to go through the expungement process to do that. But our office will um, allow them to have the voluntary dismissal so there is no conviction on their record, which will hopefully help them if they're trying to get into to schools, if they're trying to get, you know, apartment, if they're trying to, you know, to, um, to, to buy a house, those types of things. We're, we're hoping that, um, that we are helping and not having that criminal conviction on someone's record. All of our mediations are done in a safe space. Uh, due to COVID right now, most all of our mediations are done uh, virtually right now. Um, but when we are able to do them in the face-to-face, um, -face, we do them in a, a secure conference room, either in the court system or um, through our office. Uh, everything's confidential that we talk about in mediation, except, of course, if someone discusses child abuse or neglect or there's threats made to harm someone inside of a mediation or outside of a mediation, or abuse or neglect of a disabled adult, we would have to actually release that information to the proper authorities to address it. But everything else is going to be confidential. And we are also saving time from individuals having to go back and forth for court proceedings and miss time from work, miss time from school in order to go to court. If they can come to mediation and work it out, then, then they, they can save some of that time and it saves the court time as well. Next slide, please. So the creation of the private warrant court, we actually um, 
have always received cases from our district court judges. And the way we used to do it is we would go to court and we would pick up cases that the judge deemed appropriate for mediation. We would take those cases back to our office. We would reach out with a letter explaining the process, inviting the parties to come to a mediation probably two weeks later. Now that process was working. However, we were trying to find some way to expedite it so we could handle cases quicker and be a better resource to our community. So what happened is in efforts to expedite it, we began a pilot of going into courtrooms and actually offering mediation services. So we had our, our mediators to sit in court and we had to listen to some dockets and some cases would be appropriate for us and some would not. But that actually got the word out about mediation and our courts became more comfortable with our program. So we held a lot of collaborative meetings with our court personnel with le and with legislative changes. Uh, the pilot actually uh, culminated into our private warrant court. And now we go to court every Monday. And uh, basically these cases are all uh, citizen driven complaints. They're cases where someone has gone out and filed a complaint against another citizen or another resident. These are not actually cases that um, a police officer has actually filed. And so um, we go every Monday, of course, now due to COVID that, that's been on hold, but we're hoping that those courtrooms will open again in January. Um, but that has been a very good uh, process for us. We mediate on the spot. And if the case is resolved, then we the judge will, um, will basically bring the parties up to the front of the courtroom, ask the parties if they came to their agreement freely, and if this is what they're agreeing to. And if there's no payment arrangement, we can dismiss the case on the spot. If there is a payment arrangement, then we get the case continued to allow time for the payments to occur. And then our office is tasked with the responsibility of letting the court know when the agreements have been made and if the cases can be dismissed. Next slide, please. Um, due to the success of our private warrant court, the court decided they wanted us to go in and start doing uh, 50C no contact orders. And those contact orders are very specific and um, many, uh, many cases do not rise to the level of getting a 50C where you're having to actually show that there's a pattern of stalking, there's a pattern of harassment. But there, there is issues between the parties. Most of the time, these are between neighbors and friends, but they don't rise to the level of getting like a 50B restraining order. So they asked us to come in and start doing 50C no contact orders, which we give them opportunity to sit down, discuss their concerns, and see if we can work out a resolution so they can um, act civilly towards one another um, once they leave the setting. And then the mediation, those mediations, we have a courtroom every Tuesday. So every Monday and Tuesday, we now are in court, as opposed to actually doing the old way where we would go into court, get the cases and come back and have to mail it. So it, it is really ex expedited our processes very much. And I think it's been a, a really good, um, a good alternative for the clients so they don't have to keep coming back and forth. Next slide, please. Our juvenile victim offender mediation, um, that program, we receive referrals from our juvenile court counselors. And the purpose obviously is to offer a safe environment in which a juvenile who committed a crime, which is considered the offender and a person who suffered the effects is the victim can meet and talk in the presence of a, a third party neutral mediator. The way we do this program is first, we hold a offender meeting, first to gauge the appropriateness. We want to find out if the offender understands what they've done, understand that they may have caused harm to someone, understand that they, uh, the consequences for their actions, and to make sure that they are willing to take some type of responsibility. And uh, we want to make sure that if we do bring the offender and the victim together, it will be appropriate. After we uh, have the offender meeting, we meet with the victim to see if they're, if they're willing to participate in a mediation. Some of them I uh, do not want to, they have moved on, or some of them are fearful, and some of them just really want the juvenile to, to go to court and receive all the penalties that they can. But I think the, the, the challenge is, is getting the, the, this total process to go together. But when we can actually get the parties together to work out this resolution, it's very powerful. 
or just to give you an example, I had a, a very young guy. I think he was 10, and he had uh, been involved in a car break-in with some older individuals, and um, they caught him because he told me that he could not run as fast as they did. And um, But he said, you know, I only stole a car. I didn't do anything to hurt anybody. You know, I didn't punch anybody. You know, I didn't kick anybody. I didn't stab anybody. And I guess in that mediation, the victim was able to say, well, because you stole my car, I, was, I had to start taking a taxi to get back and forth to work. Because I had to take a taxi, I couldn't afford to pay the taxi. And so I ended up making, you know, missing some work. I ended up losing my job. So in that case, the, the juvenile was able to actually understand that my actions had a negative impact on someone else. And it was a very powerful mediation for this 10-year-old boy. And um, that is one of the ones that has, has kind of stuck out in my head over the years, that it really worked. And, and it, I think it really did a lot of good for the victim and the, and the, and the offender and their families. Um, and this is the only program that we can accept any felony complaints with, and those are specifically to juveniles. There are programs across the state that will do adult victim offender programs, but we only do the juvenile victim offender in this, in this type of way, and then we deal with the adult through our other types of mediations that I've already discussed. Next slide, please. Um, our call statements to the court system, Mecklenburg County District Court, we conducted a study and they found that for every case that we can mediate, it saves the course, courts two hours of time and it's equivalent to $200 per case. So if we look at our trends from 2015 to 2019, we processed 17,500 referrals. We average about a 90 to 95% success rate of our cases that we have going for our self-referrals as well as our court cases. We do have another program which deals with Medicaid and those, that, those um, success rates are a little lower just by the way that you have to do the program. Um, for example, if someone needs to have an assessment completed, we have to keep the case as an impasse so they can allow the assessments to occur. So that does bring our success rate down a little bit. But if you take those cases out, all the other types of cases that we've talked about, we have a 90 to 95 percent success rate. So over that five-year period, we saved the court system $1.5 million, which was 15,826 hours of court time that was saved. And by saving that amount of court time, then that can allow the court to spend more time on the more serious cases that, that are facing the court. Next slide, please. Our program uses uh, volunteer mediators, so we do not, we're not able to pay our mediators. Uh, we, we thank them for, you know, for everything they do for us. We are able to once a year provide them a, a meal and we will provide them a volunteer celebration, but really we're unable to pay them. And um, we have been lucky that some of our mediators have been with us over 20, 25 years. But right now we have about 75 trained volunteers who assist our staff with these cases. And according to the independent sector in 2019, for every hour that our volunteers give back to the community is a savings of $25.43 an hour. So if you look at our 2019 numbers, our volunteers provided 3,900 39, hours of service, which is a savings of over $100,000 uh, in our community through the use of our volunteers. Next slide, please. Um, I was going to have, a, I actually put this in questions, but I did want to just add that as far as our, our mediators, we train them. They go through a two-day training of all the basic mediation formats. They talk about all the steps of mediation, and we do role plays where they're actually practicing the mediation session. But after the, the role plays and the, and the two-day mediation training, they actually enter into a mentorship where they actually come to court and they observe cases where they're there with a the seasoned mediator. Uh, so they can observe the process, see how the mediator interfaces with the client, and see how the process actually occurs in, in real life situations. After they do their co-mediation, after they do observations, they enter into co-mediations 
where they're actually a, a party to the process. And then they can start mediating on their own. So we do have an extensive training program for our volunteers. And our volunteers have a wide range of, of, of um, abilities. They come from a lot of uh, different professions. We have a lot of social workers, teachers, a lot of uh, retired business owners. We have some law enforcement officers and attorneys as well. Uh, but just understand that, that when they come into mediation, they're not putting on those, those law enforcement or those attorney hats at that time. So that ends my presentation. And with that, I will turn it over to um, back to you guys. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Thanks, Vanessa. Thank you both for such um, wonderful presentations about your programs. Um, what we're going to do now is transition to any questions from members of the um, police practices group. So um, for the people who are on this, this um, team's meeting right now, um, if you have a question, please raise your hand. And then when I call on you, if you could just turn your camera on um, when you ask the question, I think that would be really helpful. We're also going to be monitoring monitoring our live streams of this presentation um, and opening up the um, discussion to questions from the public. So as soon as we get those kinds of questions, um, we will present those questions to Vanessa and to Mary. Um, you know, I have an initial question, um, Mary, in terms of how this is set up, how the organization, how the dispute resolution program is set up. Um, where is it housed? Is it housed in a community-based organization? Is it housed in a governmental agency? Um, is it, you know, within the prosecutor's office? Like, how how is it housed, and um, how is it funded? Um, our program is uh, we're actually um, a city agency, so I work for the city of Charlotte. And we we work closely with the court system, but we we're neutral, so we don't have our offices in the courthouse. Uh, we actually were were asked uh, about a couple, it's probably about three or four years ago, to move our offices into a nice newly built uh, police station that they had a really good space for us. But we had to turn that down because we didn't want it to look like we were a part of the police department. We needed we needed to know to allow people to understand that we work with the police and we're there, but we're neutral. That we are there to to facilitate the conversations. And if there's the issues that they have with the police, then we will help them through that. But by being in that setting, then that we thought that that would that would um, compromise our ability to do that. So we actually have a standalone building, and um, where we work with our partners. We're actually funded by the city of Charlotte, and we, uh, for every court case we are able to mediate, there's a court fee attached. And in Charlotte-Mecklenburg, the court fees are $180. But if the parties come to mediation and they resolve it, then they only have to pay $60, which, of course, is a third of the, of the court cost. So it is a benefit to them. The, the courts have decided that that those court fees that are paid, that they will actually send that, that money back to the mediation centers. Um, be, so we're actually get paid for the cases that we mediate successfully. And those monies go to train our mediators and to continue running our program. We, through Medicaid, we also get some, some funds as well based on the caseload that we have. Um, but our funding sources are the city of Charlotte and through our court fees. And we are um, a partners with all of these agencies, but we are standalone and we are under the city of Charlotte, um, the city government agency. Thank you. Um, and then I also have a question for, for Vanessa. When, um, Vanessa, can, are you still, okay. So when you are, um, when MPA is looking at training, as it piloted this program to train officers, what was the ultimate like goal of that of that pilot program in terms of of the community engagement community policing kind of part of it. Well, uh, we wanted to make sure um, we began that conversation of what it looked like to establish those community relations between the community residents and with police officers and change what that that relationship looks like. And so we believe that in order to do that, uh, police officers uh, needed to know more about the communities that they serve. And so as a result, the academy was birthed to um, 
to do just that. So we brought the community ambassadors in to educate and inform the officers about their particular uh, communities. So, uh, you know, one of the, I'm oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to help inform practice. Uh, one of the, you know, we've we've had some, we've had another community engagement um, conversation. We've had a, we've had a stakeholder meeting which took place last week, and one of the concerns raised by um, in that in that stakeholder meeting was, uh, you know, whether certain people within the community feel uncomfortable calling the police. Um, you know, when we're looking at some of the adaptive techniques and the, and that curriculum that you're using, I guess is there something um, regarding how community building could impact that part of it? Um, mm -hmm. Okay, could you speak to so, that? Yeah. So, um, uh, when I said in my presentation, community building is paramount. And so in order, we believe that in order for, uh, we know police are gonna be called upon to respond to, to instances of concern. However, uh, when that is not the case and we are just, uh, you know, patrolling the communities, uh, it, it, it's in the healthiest practice um, to uh, engage and build relationship uh, as it relates to, like I say, saying good morning uh, when you go, uh, getting your coffee, uh, speaking to it uh, as individuals that you see in community, um, being more engaging and just taking more of a humanistic approach to how we engage community members. And so... Um, you know, and we hope that that would then help community members understand that, yes, we do have law enforcement officers that do um, that are here to respond to uh, levels of concern. But at the same time, when there aren't levels of concern, we still have that officer who is here to support us and to uh, show us that uh, the other side, you know. And so uh, what we're hoping to highlight, what we're hoping to bring to the forefront is that we all have this humanistic side that we don't really talk about. And, you know, in order for us to get to that, we have to build relationship and build community as we do that. We um, have a question from one of our um, PPG members, um, Naomi Vertigo, who is actually the chair of our mental health subgroup. Um, one of the questions that she had is, and I think this goes to both of you in terms of the implicit bias training that both of your um, programs offer. There's some concern that implicit bias training uh, may not necessarily be effective. And so the question is, is that worth doing or how are you approaching um, bias based training? So I'll, I'll, I'll go first. Um, so uh, ba based on the reflection of the three districts, when we completed our training, we did have a conversation about that. Every district was not successful with uh, talking about implicit bias because it was really based on the level, the type of activity and the strategy that you use to talk about the, the, the topic. And so in our particular district, uh, district, our facilitator used the, like an iceberg uh, uh, visual to kind of begin that conversation. And, and the uh, officers really began to kind of dive in and we didn't really get a lot of pushback. However, uh, in other districts, um, they felt that we have been down this lane before, you know, we've heard this already. And so we've taken that um, as, as a learning experience. And like I said, you know, we want to make sure that we keep that conversation fresh and that we don't continue to bring that to the forefront or continue to have that conversation and change it. And so how we change that. And in order to change that, we had to ask the officers, what is something else that you would like to talk about in this space? Okay. Mary, did you have anything to add to that? I think Vanessa kind of covered where, where we stand. I mean, we do do implicit bias um, training. Uh, we do diversity awareness training. But we also have a lot of really good partners within the community. Race Matters for Juvenile Justice is probably the most well-known for us. And they do a really good implicit bias training for us. And I guess it's just opening the lens and allowing people to, to look to, to where what they're feeling and what they're thinking and how their behaviors and how their their words um, uh, you know can can affect different um, you know can affect everything that we do um, we are also doing with the city we're doing what we call real talk about race sessions and actually I facilitated one of those today and those are for our employees because our employees actually hear a lot of information um, you know through our residents on issues that are facing our city and that the concerns that people are having and I think 
you know, those types of initiatives that we're, we're doing, we're, we're trying to, to make it a safe space to be able to talk about these issues and hopefully to, um, you know, gain some, some, um, some initiatives to, to go forward. I mean, it really does, I think, um, go back to the relationship building and the partnership that Vanessa mentioned. I think it's very important. And if you, if you have those partnerships and those relationships, then I think those conversations are easier. And that's what we're striving mm -hmm. to do in Charlotte. Yeah, um, just to piggyback off of Mary, uh, we also talk about structural violence and community impact. You know, and so we try to drill down to, um, uh, the community level, uh, having different conversations and not always uh, implicit bias training seems, in my opinion, and I'm just using I statements in this moment, um, puts officers on the defense and continues to um, uh, put them in the space of like they're being blamed about things that are happening. And in order to begin this conversation around healing and how do we begin these uh, use best practices and change behavior, we got to have a different conversation and change that lens. And so it always seems to, once we um, talk about uh, what it means to be trauma-informed, then it seems to uh, land a little differently when we have those different conversations. And uh, as we train um, the police officers uh, over the course of those three days, what we found what made the difference in our conversation as it relates to implicit bias was the, the, the level and how we talked about it. Um, and more so allowing them to guide the conversation and as facilitators, really just trying to garner uh, the collective voice, really making sure that we adhere to the norms, really making sure that we ask questions um, that didn't necessarily put anyone on the defense, but still allow for vulnerability. So that just took a lot of facilitation skill and professional decorum, but not overlooking the elephant in the room, but um, you know, taking the more trauma-informed approach with that conversation. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Rodney Turner, who is the chair of the Civilian Oversight um, Subcommittee. Rodney? Good evening, ladies. Thank you very much for your presentations today. Let me first of all apologize if my questions to each of you uh, have missed something in your presentations. I've been on different, modal, different modes of communication throughout the presentations this evening. My first question is for Vanessa. Vanessa, can you help me out and understand what does success look for, look like for your program? I, I, I watch with an interest and in you describe what the program does, but what does success look like in your program? Um, great question. So this is a pilot. Uh, and so we're hoping what we are hoping to see uh, is um, a greater connection as it relates to response to um, community calls. Uh, we're looking at uh, how police officers are responding to different calls in community uh, and how they um, the resolve certain uh, situations. We're looking to hope that um, every situation, or not every situation, but that those situations are resolved in a more healthy manner. So it's more of a qualitative approach um, versus a quantitative metric, if that makes sense. We're looking, it's, it's uh, Devonchi and I talked about that today, like how do you measure that qualitative piece? You know, uh, and as we seek to change behavior, how do you measure that and what that looks like? And so I can tell you what we're looking and ultimately what we want to do. We want to we want to create relationship. Right. And so in or and so when police officers are called for a domestic disturbance or when police officers are patrolling in our communities and we are not uh, in that constant state of fight, flight or freeze, you know, we're not on guard. But each person on both sides of the conflict uh, feel that they know that that person is responding, coming there to support. And so um, to me, in order to, to, to measure that quantitatively, we would need to look at that data as it relates to um, the, how um, police uh, calls are resolved, uh, if that, if that uh, answers your question. It's more uh, qualitative versus quantitative and which, and which lens we're looking to um, assess through. Okay, and that, that, that's helpful uh, in the sense that you're saying it's kind of hard to measure. Um, and, yeah. and, but I'm sorry. No, no, no. So, um, yeah, it, it, 
if, if yeah, if it's kind of hard to measure the intrinsic value of the of the pilot program um, as far as it relates to the objectives that I outlined in the um, in my presentation. Uh, we haven't uh, aligned any assessment to that as of yet, as it is a um, it's still a pilot. Um, but as it relates to um, our other lanes at the Metropolitan Peace Academy, the outreach uh, lane and our case management lane, we do look at different uh, quantitative measures as it relates to our um, our professionals understanding the pillars as it relates to the CP4P um, approach. Okay, I, I only asked the question because I wonder if it, you, I, do you have difficulty getting buy-in if you can't show demonstrable improvements or de demonstrable impact? Um, because it sounds like it's a it's a positive program. I'm just wondering, is it being effective? And if, if so, how can you show that? Yeah, so we just launched it in October. Um, and so this was our first pilot. And so we're looking, we're right at the table again, now tuning um, our, our feedback based on what the officers uh, walked away with, based on what we as a team walked away with. Um, we're taking another look at the curriculum. We're looking once again at the implicit bias piece. I'm um, seeing if we need to uh, incorporate something different and where other gaps we um, based on our feedback uh, remain. And so as a result of that, we'll, we'll probably um, update and provide another iteration of the curriculum um, moving forward. So we have we don't even really have another training on the books yet, but the charge is to train all 22 districts in Chicago. And so our next um, our next lane and the next step is to get our facilitators back to the table to provide more training. Thank you. If I may, I have a question for Mary and I'll jump out of here as well. Mary, my question is somewhat related to the question I asked Vanessa, but it's a little bit more pointed. Um, can do you have data or have you been have you been measuring the success of your diversionary program, if, if I call it that, or mediation program, or however you want to characterize it, how you characterize it, in the sense of less recidivism or or more re reformation of the people who've gone through the program? Um, I'm sorry, I'm butchering the question, but do you understand sort of what I'm getting at here? Um, yeah, and I mean that is that is. A kind of a hard question too. We do get cases where individuals will come and will mediate a situation with one and then they will come back you know, months or a year later and they'll have an issue with someone else. Uh, for the most part, uh, what we're trying to do through mediation is to one, resolve the issue that they're having by going through the process so they're able to talk and, and be able to express their concerns and ask for what they want. And hopefully that that is a, a teaching process that maybe if they find themselves in a situation in the future, that they can go back and take those skills and, um, you know, work things out with someone so they don't actually get back into the court system. Uh, we do have cases that keep coming back, um, unfortunately. It would be nice if we didn't. Um, I guess the, the biggest thing that we can um, gauge is the fact of our success would be individuals that, um, for example, landlords that contact us and say they don't want to do mediation, they just, you know, they want to go to court and they want their, they, they just want their court date and they want their money. But we were able to help someone uh, just uh, last week and that in, that landlord is now saying, you know, I'm not going to go to court anymore. I'm going to send all my cases through mediation because I felt it was it was worthwhile. It's getting me what I want, and it's also helping my tenants. So I think for us, maybe hearing some of those is kind of success. Um, our DA's office and our courts um, really are behind our programs, and um, as far as sending cases our way. Uh, but as far as actually saying that, you know, this person, you know, never had to come back through our program again, I really don't have that type of data. Um, I mean, we're hopeful that, you know, we're, we're hearing from different individuals that, you know, yes, your program worked and thank you for the skills because I was able to, to work this out. But it's basically on a case by case basis that we're kind of getting that information. Thank you very much. For your, thank you for the answer, Mary, and thank you for the time, Devonji. Thank you, Rodney. Um, we have a question um, from Susan Hirsch, who has been supporting the um, work of the PPG, um, and in particular with the stakeholder meetings that we've been having. Um, the question is, Mary, would you recommend trying to establish a program where mediators could be paid? And are there any issues with relying on volunteers? Uh, for, for our program, 
we've been we've been blessed. We have wonderful mediators that um, have volunteered their time for years and years, and we've been we've had a great pool, and we've we've always had great success with them. I understand that we would love to be able to pay our mediators for what they do, but I also think there's value in having them be volunteers. And the reason why I say that is a lot of the clients when they come to us for mediation, a lot of them will sort of assume at the beginning that maybe we're a part of the court system or that we're getting paid to do what we're doing. And for our volunteers to say, you know, no, I'm here as a volunteer. I'm here to give my time to hear what you have to say and to try to work out a resolution. And I think that goes a long way to getting parties to really open up and really trust the process and be able to really find a, a resolution. Uh, so, I mean, as, as a staff person, I still mediate, I'm still a mediator, but we try to give our volunteers as much mediation um, cases as possible because I do think it does have that value. Uh, do, do, would it be nice to be able to pay our mediators? Definitely. And there are programs across the state that will pay their mediators. And if we find a program that that will call us and say, you know, do you have, would you, would you recommend any, any of your mediators to do this paid program? We will definitely do that. Um, but for us, um, we've never had a problem getting mediators. We always have a waiting list for our training and we've been very successful with, with having that model and, you know, demonstrating the fact that just by, you know, spending the time and, and, you know, and this is just basically your passion. You're not getting paid for it. I think it really does go a long way to, to helping individuals come to a win-win. Um, and Naomi also has a question, but I just wanted to ask a quick follow-up to Rodney's question about um, mediation in, in, and recidivism. Are there, if you, if you know that there's a case involving the same parties, like if there's a neighbor to neighbor kind of dispute, if you know that you've previously mediated that type of matter, is there something that would prevent or is there some policy that you guys have where you would not elect to mediate that type of dispute again? Yes. We would mediate um, the dispute over and over. What we would probably do in that situation if we had two parties come to mediation and it worked for a while and then they had a situation, we'd probably go back to that agreement because we keep copies of the agreement and just kind of see if we could start there and mediate what's going on. Um, as long as the case does not involve the, 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 the cases we can't do, such as domestic violence, the custody, uh, the, um, the felony offenses, as long as it doesn't involve any of those, we will, move, we will mediate them. Uh, so there's, we don't have a policy and our court doesn't have a policy that, you know, if you've gone through mediation once, you can't go back through it again, or we won't send them to mediation. Sometimes individuals that go to mediation, if they don't resolve it, then of course, you know, they won't elect to try mediation in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, but the ones that do, you usually get a, a, a decent outcome for that. But, uh, but we'll mediate as many times as we need to, to, to help the parties come to, to whatever resolution they need. And uh, Naomi, uh, you're up and thanks for letting me, you know, jump right in front with my follow-up question. Sure, this has been a really interesting presentation. So um, I thank the presenters for that. Um, my question is in the case of um, people with disabilities as the offenders, um, is there are there any special considerations or training for the mediators in handling those kinds of cases? Thank you. In regards to our program, we do talk about um, making sure that the individuals are able to make their own decisions. If you're talking about a disability that you're unable to see, uh, that we will um, have individuals that will bring care caregivers with them if they do, if we do have a situation where we feel that a person is unable to make their own decision due to a disability, again, that we can't see. Um, as far as physical disabilities, we always make sure that that we have it in a setting where we are, are accessible to, to everyone. We do get interpreters. We um, do a lot of cases for the deaf and hard of hearing community. So we will get sign language interpreters to assist with them. 
So um, what we do in our training is we will let our mediators know that there are some special cases and some special skills in order to to work with um, all the clients that we have. If you have an interpreter, it's going to usually take a little bit longer to do a mediation because the interpreter has to interpret for both parties. And it's, uh, some of our interpreters are simultaneous interpreters, um, which they're amazing. Um, but it does, it you know, it is it is something that the mediator has to be aware of that they're giving the interpreter enough time to to explain what's going on. And obviously, if we do feel that the, that a person is limited in their understanding of the processes, we never want to make sure we we always want to make sure that a person who signs an agreement is assigning it and they understand fully what is said. I always make sure our mediators read the agreements, um, not not take for granted that, that the person can read it on their own. So we always take measures into making sure that we are reading the agreements to everyone, that we make sure that they understand it. If they don't understand it, we make sure that they have a caregiver or someone with them. And of course, we always make sure that our mediators are, are able to work with interpreters they are comfortable to do so. So we do take those into consideration and we work very closely with our local disability rights and um, resources community and um, really lean on them a lot to make sure that we're doing the things that we need to do in order to, to address our community in the right way. I was thinking specifically of, um, let's say, children or young adults with mental illness. Um, is that something that either of you address um, in your training or in other ways. Thank you. For us, we don't um, go I'm sorry, Mary, um, step onto the mental health issues involving juveniles. We would usually, again, um, yield to some of the mental health professionals that we have um, in our local community to, to get some of that information. For the most part, we if we if we have a juvenile where we feel that there's some um, mental issues, um, we usually are not referred those cases. Those cases are usually um, scanned for us um, by the court system, by the juvenile counselors. So, and if we do get a case like that, we would again, um, we would reach out to our partners for some assistance in that. But we just want to make sure that, again, they, they don't sign anything and that, that they are understanding what is going on before we would enter in any type of agreement that they may have. Um, as far as our work with the uh, our officers, um, we talked some about ACEs and trauma. Uh, we also, uh, in the other lanes at the academy, we talk a lot about the positive youth development uh, and mental health first aid uh, and how, um, and um, trauma in the brain. And so that uh, helps to uh, support our efforts in working with uh, children with disabilities and individuals with, with mental uh, with mental issues, as well as um, speaking to some of the things that um, um, some of us in community deal with ourselves. Thank you. Um, so, thank you, Naomi. Thank you um, for the, those questions. I've, I think we have time for one final question. I want to make sure that we address a question from the from the community. Um, a question was asked for both of you when looking at a community um, like Arlington, what would you recommend as a starting point to initiate um, programs like the programs that you both um, are uh, leading? Um, I would say take a, a needs assessment. I would definitely say take a needs assessment from the community to see what they think. Um, here in Chicago, every I wouldn't say every community is different, but we were t attempting to do a housing project with one particular project I'm working on. Um, and the community was very offended because no one came to talk to them about what we need. 
Uh, and so I um, just encourage that we take a needs assessment uh, and that we uh, create a table that includes all the stakeholders, uh, stakeholders to garner everyone's voice, you know, and create that community building process that starts um, the way that you start really dictates and, and really informs the way that you're going to either sustain your programming or build upon your programming. And as we begin our programming, we have a social responsibility to make sure that certain pro that our programming is trauma informed. And so in order to make sure that make sure that our, all of the stakeholders are there, you know, and at that particular table after we've done that, um, that is that assessment of our community and what the needs are. That's my recommendation. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mary. Do you have thoughts on my what would be a good starting point for for a community like Arlington? Um, my recommendation would be um, I, I totally agree with Vanessa, and I also agree that for us it was it was partnerships um, from the very beginning. It was a lot of legwork getting the getting the the program started, but it started with those those conversations, those collaborative efforts as to what the community was asking for, what they needed, and then going to the partners and having everybody sit down and discuss, you know, really what's going on. I mean, for us, in order to do a mediation program, you have to have, you know, your your partnerships with your court system, you, uh, the, the sheriff's department, the police department, the school system, uh, those, um, the homeowners association, the landlord tenant um, associations, the realtor associations. I mean, all those partnerships is the reason why we, we receive cases and they were able to sustain our program. So I would say, you know, I agree with Vanessa to do the needs assessment to find out what, what your community is wanting and then to really, um, really work on those partnerships and those relationships going forward and see if you can, um, you know, really bring everybody together to to um, to create that win-win. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, you know, on behalf of the um, ADR subgroup, I want to thank both of you, um, Vanessa and Mary. Thanks so much for sharing um, the information and the insight that that you have regarding the programs that um, you both are running. I mean, it's, this was really valuable information for us as we are looking at alternatives to, um, you know, traditional policing and alternatives to our criminal justice yeah. options. And so I want to thank you both for spending your evening with us. Um, and so on behalf of the police practices group and our community, um, I want to thank the community for joining us as well. Um, thank you so much for, for your time and the information. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. Have a good evening. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much.